For the past two weeks, uh, we have been in a series titled Building Bigger People. And uh, for the past two Sundays, uh, Pastor Mark has taught on this theme. And I personally have been inspired and, and challenged uh, over the course of uh, these two weeks. And, and hopefully you have, no doubt you have as well. And so I'm honored to be able uh, to teach on week three of the Building uh, Bigger People series and I want us to begin by reading a story found in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 37, we're going to pick up the account of an Old Testament figure known as Joseph. And we're going to look at Joseph's journey today. So we're going to read from Genesis chapter 37, starting in verse 1. Now, I must uh, pre-warn you that we're about to read an entire chapter of the Bible. So uh, if you didn't read your Bible before you came to church today, you are welcome. <laughs> I'm about to, to help you out. So you're going to stay with me this morning. I promise I'm, I'm, I'm reading uh, what is important uh, for these few moments that we have together. So Genesis chapter 37 and verse 1, it says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, which is another message for another day. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf arose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Just imagine if your teenage son or daughter around the dinner table this afternoon said, mom or dad, I just, I need you to know something. Um, there's going to come a day well, you're going to bow down to me. Son, go to your room before I smack you up the stairs. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Are we okay to keep going this morning? That's just the intro, so stick with me. Verse 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But when they saw him in the distance... And, and, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. 
Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there, where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Genesis chapter 37. And I want us to spend the moments uh, that we have remaining today looking at Joseph's journey, as I've said. And uh, as we continue this series, Building Bigger People, uh, I want to kind of subtitle today's uh, message, The Turning Point. The Turning Point. That's what we're going to speak from this morning. Can we pray one more time? And let's ask that God would speak to us. Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that today... As we read it, you would, you would speak to us, God, as we get in and around it, God, you would reveal yourself to us and that you would change us from the inside out, God, that we might leave different to how we came in, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. So just to kind of um, paint a picture for what we've read in Genesis uh, chapter 37 in as, as little time as I can. We, we, we see Joseph, a, a young boy at the age of 17 who has had a dream, a dream um, that has revealed to him that one day his brothers and his family will bow down to him. Now this, this dream was not some kind of pipe dream. This dream was not some kind of dream that Joseph had conjured up all by himself. This was a prophetic dream. This was a God-given dream. And so he reveals it to his family. As we know, they're not uh, best pleased. And, and the Bible actually discloses for us that, 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 that Joseph was his father's favorite son. And so, so his brothers, already aware of that fact, now are being told um, that the brother who your father likes more than you is one day going to rule over you. And so for his brothers, this was no doubt like adding insult to injury. And one day his brothers are out in the field, and Joseph's father, who we, who we will see referred to as both Jacob and Israel in this story, says to Joseph, I want you to go out into the field. I want you to find your brothers, and I want you to bring back word to me that everything is Okay, so Joseph goes, he finds his brothers, 
And while he is at a distance, his brothers plot to kill him. One of the brothers then steps in and says, hey, let's let's not kill him, but let's throw him in this hole. So Joseph approaches them. They take off the robe that his father had given him, and they throw him in the hole. Then his brothers sit down for lunch, as you do, following an occasion like that. And and so while they're eating their meal, a, a group of travelers approach from a distance, a group of travelers known as the Ishmaelites. And the Bible says that the Ishmaelites were traveling from Gilead on their way to Egypt. Bear that in mind. So the Ishmaelites, they approach, and the brothers around the dinner table decide, hey, what benefit is it to us if we kill Joseph? Why not make some money out of him, get him out of the hole, and sell him to the Ishmaelites? And so that's what they did. And then the Ishmaelites, they purchase Joseph and take him to Egypt. Now, the reason why that is a significant piece of information, and I don't mean to bring a a spoiler alert so soon into the message, but I need you to know something about Joseph. And that is that Joseph's dream would come to pass. And the place where it would come to pass would be Egypt. It's crucial information. Because it might have seemed to Joseph at the time that the Ishmaelites would surely end up preventing his dream from ever coming to pass. It might have seemed to Joseph that the the role of the Ishmaelites was to inflict pain upon him. But the Ishmaelites were not there to cause Joseph pain. The Ishmaelites were there because they were sent by God as the chosen vehicle to take him from where he was into where God needed him to be. You see, you might be going through a struggle right now. You might be facing some pain. But whatever it is that is causing you that pain, can I suggest to you that that same very thing is God's chosen vehicle. Not to inflict pain upon you, but it's God's chosen vehicle to lead you directly into your promise. If we're going to clap, let's clap. In, in January of this year, uh, our family landed in Australia for my brother's wedding, and while we were in Australia, um, we decided to take a a short trip to Sydney. And so eight of us get on a plane and we land in Sydney. We grab all of our bags and we jump into a taxi that's going to take us to our hotel. And so the eight of us are in this taxi and a few minutes into the journey, uh, the taxi driver turns around and, and says to us, would you like me to put on some music? We say, sure, go for it. So he turns on his Spotify playlist and uh, begins to play some tunes. And and, and they were pretty good tunes, and like we were enjoying the ride. And a few minutes go by, and and, and the volume increases to the point where this is kind of now slightly turning into a rave in the taxi. (laughs) I mean, it's kind of at that level now. A few more minutes go by and the taxi driver turns around again and and he asks us, would you like me to take it up a notch? (laughs) Now we're thinking, well, I'm not sure to what notch you can now take this. But, But what we thought he meant was the level of volume. What he actually meant was the level of production. Because... We would then watch as out from the ceiling, this is, this is no joke, 
would come a, a disco ball. <laughs> this really happened. Came a disco ball that, 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 that flashed all colors of the rainbow around this taxi. And so now we're having a real party on the way to the hotel. A few more moments go by, and out from the floor, <laughs> it, gets, it gets better, comes a smoke machine. <laughs> this, this happened. And so now we have LED lights going all around the taxi. We have smoke machines pumping out smoke at a rate like you couldn't believe it. And, and I don't know what people outside of the taxi were thinking. Probably they're getting as high as a kite inside of that vehicle. The amount of smoke that's pumping out of there, it just it cannot be good. And so, and so this was like the perfect moment, you know, to, to capture an Instagram story because, you know, what says Instagram story like a, a party bus, okay? So, so he continues to play his music and, um, you know, he has, he has his whole level of production and operations and, I, I mean, it, 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 was quite, it was quite the show. Um, and, and, then, and then a song comes on that... Um, let's just say, um, let's just say it had some choice language in the middle of it. And we knew the song, not because, you know, we listened to it, of course. Gosh, I'm a man of God. <laughs> um, it, it was Lee told me it had bad language in And, uh, and, 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 and there are t- like there are two kids in this, in this taxi with us, one's five, one's seven. So we know what's coming. So we, we try to protect them from the music. So we shout to the taxi driver, hey, would you mind turning this one off? He interpreted that as, hey, would you mind turning this one up? <laughs> so now we have... This, this music playing and, and, and expletives going left, right, and center. So we have to apply, you know, like the cough tactic when a song, don't act all spiritual with me now. You know when a song comes on and you know like there's, there's some choice language and you can't do anything about it and there are children in the car and, and so when the, when the word comes up that you don't want them to hear, you just conveniently have to cough at that point or, or do a big sneeze or whatever or just, you know, divert attention however, however possible. So we, we get to the hotel and it's, it's, it's a nice hotel in Sydney. And so, so we, we, we arrive at the entrance and... Um, like a couple of the staff, they, they come out to us and, you know, to help us with our, our bags. And, and, the, and the taxi driver, he gets out and he opens all the doors. He opens the boot, but doesn't turn anything off. <laughs> so now this English family of eight have arrived at this hotel in Sydney, Australia, with smoke pouring out of the vehicle a disco ball traveling around 360 degrees and an inappropriate music blasting out for all the neighbors to hear. I'm like, man, you could could have shut this down when we pulled up at the hotel, but oh no, he wanted to let everybody know the virtuals have arrived. (laughs) You You know, for us on that journey, The destination was as planned. We got to where we were supposed to go. The destination was as planned, but the journey was not as expected. And here's what you've got to understand about God. Because if you want to build a bigger life, you need to know this, that if God... If God makes you a promise, he will be faithful to keep his promise. If God gives you a dream, you better believe that dream will come to pass. But don't expect the journey that leads you there to look how you expected it to look. If you have in mind what following Jesus looks like, As this walk through the park and there are daffodils 
and there are white picket fences, and there are dogs. No cats, no cats. <laughs> that wouldn't be right. <laughs> but but you, you, you think it's this, you know, just real smooth peaches and cream kind of, kind of journey. You, you're going to quickly get messed up. When, when trying to follow Jesus. He will be faithful to the destination, but, but, but don't hold him to the journey. Because here's a newsflash for you, it, it won't be as expected. You'll get there, yes. but the journey that led you there ain't going to look how you thought it would look. And if you want to build a bigger life, the sooner you can be okay with that, the better. So Joseph is sold into slavery, and the Ishmaelites, they take him to Egypt, and they then sell him on to a guy by the name of Potiphar. Now, Potiphar was one of Pharaoh's officials, Pharaoh, who was ruler of Egypt at the time. And so Joseph now finds himself living in the home of a very influential man within this nation. He's a slave, yes, he's a servant, yes, but in an influential environment nonetheless. And the Bible says that God was with Joseph. And God gave him success in everything that he did. And because of this, Joseph found favor in the eyes of his master, Potiphar. And then Potiphar promoted Joseph to take charge of his entire household. And then listen to what the Bible says. From the moment Potiphar appointed Joseph, the household of Potiphar was blessed. You see, the blessing of God was never just intended to stay on you. It was always intended to flow through you. You can tell that God was with Joseph because the atmosphere around Joseph began to shift the moment he stepped into it. You can tell the hand of God upon someone's life because the moment they step into the office on a Monday morning, something changes. You can tell when the hand of God is on someone's life because the moment they walk through the door of their home, the atmosphere has to shift. Why? Because the hand of God... Is upon that person's life. And the hand of God not only wants to work in you, it wants to work through you. And so the, pot, the, the household of Potiphar was blessed from this moment forward. Now Potiphar's wife begins to take a fancy to Joseph. And on several occasions pleads to sleep with him. Joseph, because he is honorable first and foremost to God, Second of all, to his master Potiphar, refuses. But she keeps persisting. And then, I'll, and then on one day in particular, Joseph walks into Potiphar's house and the servants are nowhere to be found. The attendants aren't where they usually are. And so Potiphar's wife spies the perfect opportunity. She runs to Joseph, grabs him by his robe and pleads again, hey, sleep with me. Joseph flees the scene, leaving his robe in Potiphar's wife's possession. Now, of course, she's all embarrassed. She's going to have to make up a story and quick as to why she has his robe. And so she finds Potiphar and says, um, you just need to know something about Joseph. Joseph tried to sleep with me. I screamed, and he ran, leaving his robe behind. And so Potiphar believes his wife, goes and finds Joseph, and has him put in jail. Just, just notice, again, Joseph's journey. It, it seems like he's gaining some traction. Seems like momentum's on his side, and he, he, he takes one step forward, and that feels like he's taking two steps back. And so now Joseph is in prison because he has been wrongfully accused 
That's quite a serious act. And, and listen to this. Joseph is in prison. And the Bible says that God was with Joseph. No, notice how, how God's presence never left his side. God's presence didn't leave when things got tough. God did not leave Joseph's side in the hole, in the prison cell. God was with Joseph. And because God was with Joseph, Joseph got another promotion. And now Joseph is placed in charge and made responsible for all the prisoners in that particular prison. You know what's amazing to me about the story of Joseph is it tells me this. God wants to build a bigger life out of you in any and every season. In any and every season. Maybe there are times in your life where you have discounted yourself from God doing anything significant with your life because you have used the phrase, it's not my season. Can I ask you a question? Who told you it wasn't your season? Because the, the times when Joseph was getting promotions, he, he'd been sold by his family. Then he was wrongfully accused. And the places that those that those incidents and those moments put him in were places where he experienced promotion and increase. His world was enlarged. But I don't think in the prison cell or in the hole, Joseph was walking around like, this is my season. This has got my season written all over it. I don't think it felt like that for Joseph. Yet, it might not have felt like his season, but it was. Because when you realize that God is with you, you realize I can bear fruit in every season. It doesn't matter whether I'm on the mountaintop or whether I have been left for dead in a hole, if God is with me, something good is going to come out of this. If God is with me, I can trust that I'm coming out of this a bigger person with a bigger life. Furthermore, notice how Joseph didn't complain. He didn't moan. Notice how we, we don't detect bitterness from Joseph. Someone who had every reason to be bitter, abandoned by his family, wrongfully accused, yet not bitter. Why? Because when you realize that God is on your side, you, you don't waste time focusing on who or what is against you. Because you know if God is for me, no one or no thing can be against me. If God is on my side, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I could have been abandoned. I could have been lied about. But God's on my side. And, and, and the people that I could hate, and the people that I could be bitter towards, I can actually start to thank. Because God started to use them to lead me into his promise 
for me. You got to help me this morning. You got to help me. Come on. You don't need to be bitter. You don't need to be angry. You don't need to hate those who hurt you. They are not your enemy. They're your friend. Because God used them. If it weren't for them, would you be where God intended for you to be? It would do you good to leave church today. I don't know whether it's the headset or whatever, but I just, I feel fired up today. It would do, it would do you good to walk out of church and text or call someone who did you wrong and say thank you. 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 I thought you were the enemy. I thought you came to bring me pain, but you actually came to transport me into my promise. So Joseph is is in the pit. And now he's in a prison. And while he's in the prison, two of Pharaoh's officials who have offended the king are thrown in there with him. A cupbearer and a baker. No candlestick maker. Just the two of them. And one night, they have a dream. And they wake up the next morning and, and, and Joseph notices something about their countenance because they, they look downcast. They look sad. They, 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 they seem pretty down. And Joseph, he says, hey, hey guys, like, what's up? And they said, well, we, we both had dreams last night, but, but none of us can interpret them. We, we don't know what to do with these dreams. And so... And so Joseph looks at these two guys. And in, in, in Genesis 40 and verse 8, which we'll read in just a moment, I believe we find the turning point in Joseph's journey. Because at this point in his life, Joseph is now 28 years of age. It's been 11 years since he was given a dream by God. It's been 11 years since he pulled his brothers and his parents aside and said, hey, I've had a dream. Let me tell you what it is. Fast forward 11 years. He's gone from being a teenager to a man. 17, he said, I've had a dream. Let me tell you. At 28, let's read it, Genesis chapter 40 and verse 8. He looks at the cupbearer and the baker and he says, tell me your dreams. Notice the shift in Joseph's language. Age of 17, I've had a dream. Let me tell you what it is. 11 years go by, 28 years of age. You've had a dream. Tell me more. Tell me about the dream. I, I, I want to help. I want to commit to your dream. I, 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 I want to serve it so that it can become a reality. Somewhere in that 11-year period, Joseph understood this, that the key to the dream that God has given me is in the dream that he's given others. Let me say it again. Joseph understood that the key to the dream that God has given me is in the dreams that he has given others. And the moment Joseph committed to somebody else's dream was the moment he began the journey of fulfilling his own. Two more years would go by before Joseph would get the opportunity to interpret yet another dream. He'd accurately interpreted the dream of the cupbearer and the baker. 
And what he said would happen, happened. And two years later, King Pharaoh has a dream, but with no one to interpret it for him. And the cupbearer says, hey, King, I, I remember this guy a couple years ago. And I had a dream that I couldn't interpret. And he was able to accurately interpret it for me. So maybe he can do the same for you. And so Joseph is pulled out of prison, presented before the king. And I love what Joseph says to Pharaoh. He says, I can't interpret your dream, but God can. That's, that's, that's an attribute of someone who will be used mightily by God. I can't, but God can. And so God, God interpreted Pharaoh's dream through Joseph. And what Joseph said would happen, happened. Pharaoh is so impressed by this boy, this man, that he says to him, I'm going to place you second in command over this entire nation. You, 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 you're going to be in charge, Joseph. And Joseph would then lead Egypt through seven years of abundance and then seven years of famine, which was revealed in Pharaoh's dream. And because they had been able to accurately interpret the dream, Egypt was able to store up food during the seven years of abundance in preparation for the next season of famine. And so during the seven years of famine, the Bible says that people came from all over the world to get food from Egypt, more specifically from Joseph. Have a guess who was amongst those who made their way to Egypt, got on their knees before Joseph and pleaded for him to give them some food, his brothers. Now listen to what Joseph says in Genesis 42 and verse 8 through 9. It says, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them. I think that's key for us to understand today because that tells us that Joseph had forgotten about his dream, which then indicates that Joseph was not abusing this principle. Joseph did not abuse the principle of if I serve somebody else's dream, God will fulfill my own. Joseph did not see serving Pharaoh's dream as a stepping stone to stepping into his. Joseph had forgotten all about his dream, meaning he simply served Pharaoh out of a desire to do just that serve just I'm just here to serve and one day Joseph realizes this is the dream this is the dream that has come true I'd forgotten all about it I was so consumed by serving somebody else that I forgot about myself and in the process of forgetting about myself and committing my life to somebody else, God has blessed me. And God has fulfilled His promise to me. If you want to build a big life, here it is. Get around people with big dreams and serve them. You might not want to hear that this morning. 
this might, might not be the most popular message. Because if you've got a big dream, it takes some, some big character to put it to one side, to lay it down, and to forget all about it and say, I'm going to go find somebody else with a big dream and I'm going to serve them. And maybe today you have a dream. Maybe today there's something on the inside of you that is stirring within you. But I'm also aware there are people in here and you are clueless as to the plan of God for your life. The same principle applies to both. For those who have dreams and for those who don't, the best thing you can do is to find somebody else and serve them. You want to build a big life? You want God to fulfill His promise to you? You want to be everything that God created you to be? Do everything that God created you to do? Lay down the dream and pick up somebody else's. Not out of a desire for it to be a stepping stone that gets you to where you want to be, but out of a genuine desire to serve and to love people. You see, when you start to serve somebody else's dream, God starts to unfold yours. When you commit to somebody else's vision, God starts to unfold yours. And today, I do believe, can be a turning point in your life where you make a decision. I'm going to lay it all down. I'm going to live for something that is bigger than myself. I don't want to live my life serving me. I want to live it serving somebody else. And I do believe that when you, you have that about you, that's when God starts to open doors for your life that you could never think of, dare to dream of, ask for, believe for, anticipate, expect. And so today, if you want this day to be a turning point in your life, I'm going to ask you right where you sat to lift your hand and say, right now, right here, I surrender my dreams and I'm going to go find somebody else and serve them. If that's you, lift your hands all across this place. Hey, if you don't know where to start today, you're in the right place because you're in an environment. You're part of a community with big dreams and big visions. We have pastors with big dreams and with big visions. You don't have to go searching today for who to serve and what to serve. Look no further than this house. Today, Father, I pray for those who acknowledge today is going to be a turning point for me. Today is going to be the day where I lay down my dreams, my desires, my goals, and my ambitions, and I'm going to serve somebody else. I'm going to serve something bigger than myself. And I believe, God, it's in those moments where you're going to begin to do for us what we would never be able to do for ourselves. You can put your hands down. I want to pray for a second group of people today and those, for those of you who don't yet have a relationship with God. You might have walked in here knowing about God. But there's a world of difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Maybe, maybe the, there was a time in your life where you knew God and you had a relationship with God. But you've, you've just gone off and done your own thing. 
today, I want to pray for you. And I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to call you out by name. But I do want to include you in a prayer that we're all going to pray together. So I'm going to ask out of respect for you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Because this moment's between you and God. Not the person on your left or your right. This moment's between you and God. And today, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you want to acknowledge, I believe that God is who He says He is, that He sent His one and only Son to die on the cross for me, to forgive me of my sins, He rose again to give me life and life to the full. He's prepared a place for me in heaven where I will spend eternity one day with Him. And today I want to give my life over to Jesus. If that is you on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand, keep it nice and high, just so I can see. And then I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. So if that's you, you know who you are. Today's your day. One, Jesus loves you. Two, today's the day of salvation. Three, shoot your hand up all over this place so I can see. I see that hand. Beautiful. Anyone else? I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? You know who you are. I see those hands. Hands going up. I see them. I see them. Anyone else? Anyone else? Come on, let's celebrate those who are making the greatest decision of their lives today. Hey, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. we are all going to repeat collectively after me. Are you ready? Dear Jesus. I invite you into my heart. Come and be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Today I choose to surrender my life to your plan and to your will for me. I believe from this moment forward, I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. One more time, let's congratulate those who made that decision.